Jesus. All right. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Callie Ryder. And <laughs> for those of you who do know me, they shout out, please. Um, also known as Jed Ryder's sister. I don't really like going by that all the time. Um, I am a registered dietitian and I have my master's in um, environmental studies, but the focus was on food systems and sustainable agriculture. Um, so I'm really interested in science of, of like what happens in our bodies and nutrition and all that, but I'm particularly interested in like how that fits into the bigger picture of land and culture and tradition and all that kind of stuff, like anthropology. So this is going to be very kind of heavy on the science and also the big picture. Oh, focus on facts today. Okay, so in the 1980s, fat was kind of demonized. I'm sure everybody can remember that. And it still very much affects our lives today. A lot of people are avoiding fat and cholesterol and all this kind of stuff. Um, dietary fat and cholesterol have had a bad rap. Research was far from solid, but it was lobbied very hard by a handful of scientists. Um, and it led to widespread recommendations and dietary guidelines to limit saturated fat, cholesterol, and total fat. But, as you will see, it actually made things much worse. In the low-fat guidelines of the 1980s, um, when, when they came out, you can see it, uh, this is a, shows like a rise in obesity. Um, what we did was we, we replaced fat with sugar, refined flours, and refined oils. Americans got bigger and sicker. So it backfired. There's also an insane increase in sugar consumption, as you can see in this graph. Like sugar increased in like the 1900s, but like by 2000, it was just like between, you can see like the 80s and 2000, it was just like an insane increase in sugar. So health professionals like me, we've been kind of changing our recommendations. Fat is not making people sick. Processed food is making people sick. And we're seeing much better results with our patients as a result. Um, and now as a dietitian, I'm in a constant state of defending and promoting fat. People come up to me and it's like, well, I don't eat, I don't eat fat, I don't eat red meat. And it's like, I'm fine. Um, and I have to kind of change their paradigm on it. If I look at a three-day diet recall, which is what I do with every one of my new patients, I don't look for things like butter, red meat, and cholesterol. It's one of the last things I ever even look for. I look for whole foods versus processed foods. Um, essentially, that's exactly what I do. And I try to get people closer to the continuum of whole foods and less towards processed foods. Most people in our country, the standard American diet, are heavily eating only processed foods. <clears throat> so, um, Time Magazine, okay, fat is coming back in a very real way. Time Magazine even did another thing on it. Um, this is June of 2014, all of a sudden fat isn't an enemy. <laughs> I just I wish they would have done that. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna break down what fats are. Just like when, when I, I often assume people know what fats are, but I realize most of what I know came from my Nutrition 101 class my freshman year of college. So Dietary Fats 101. There's plant fats, fats that come from plants, and fats that come from animals. And cholesterol only comes from animals. Um, broken down into its smallest form, fats are called fatty acids. We have saturated fatty acids and unsaturated fatty acids. I'm sure you guys have heard these two things. Saturated means every single one of those carbons in the chemical structure has a hydrogen on it. It is saturated with hydrogen molecules. Unsaturated means there might be a double bond or two in there. So that's an unsaturated fatty acid. In food, we have three main categories. Saturated, it's typically animal-based. It's solid at room temperature, and our body can make it if we need to. Um, and as you see, once the fat is extracted from coconut oil, which is a plant that happens to be high in saturated fat, it is solid at room temperature. Monounsaturated, this is where olive oil gets its fame. Is typically plant-based, liquid at room temperature, and our body can make them if we need them. And then we have polyunsaturated. Plant-based, liquid at room temperature, it must be eaten. Our body cannot make polyunsaturated fats, and I will delve into that a little more. 
So this is a closer look at a saturated fat. We have you know bacon fat, um, butter, and coconut oil all solid at room temperature. Monounsaturated fat, um, avocado oil, canola oil, and olive oil are high in that, and that's one double bond, monounsaturated. Polyunsaturated, we got two double bonds. Um, and that's where fish oil comes from, um, and uh, soybean oil, and sunflower oil. Those are just examples. But not all fats are composed of one thing. Um, so we're gonna kind of zoom in on this. Look at beef fat, chicken fat. You know, we demonize these fats or have because of their saturated fat, 52%, 31%, but it's also almost half monounsaturated fat, the healthy fat that's in olive oil. Um, as you can see down there, olive oil and it's but, but olive oil still has a little bit of saturated fat in there. Nobody talks about that. So we'll be coming back to that. Um, it's also split into two other categories: fats found in nature and man-made fats. Parquet, I grew up on parquet every single morning. Parquet on pancakes. Okay, fats found in nature. They've been in the human diet for millennia, require little to no processing and minimal technology. The average person, farm, ranch, village had the ability to produce it. These are called also traditional fats. So the traditional um, coconut oil making, this is very, I mean, steps that the average person can do. Um, and then you have very minimal technology. This is like a traditional culture making coconut oil. <clears throat> then we have the man-made newly introduced fats. Introduced to the human diet in the past 100 years require very heavy processing and refining um, and require recent technology brought on by the Industrial Revolution. These are your hydrogenation and trans fats. I'm sure you, this has been big in the press in the past 10 years, these trans fats. Um, and we also have heavily refined vegetable oils that are very new to our diet also. Your soybean, sunflower, safflower, canola, cotton and vegetable. And I, when I looked at vegetable again, I got a kick out of it. Like, this is not comfort vegetables. It's a very good marketing when they came out with this. <clears throat> and then you have your mar margarine and shortening um, also included in these fats. So you have a lot of steps, required a lot of machinery to make these oils. Um, this is soybean processing facility, um, and then it's, you know, more technology. So um, here's a look at soybean oil consumption, and you might wonder why there was a sudden rise in soybean oil um, in the 1960s, and then the technology to extract the oil was just in the 1950s. <clears throat> Um, and it therefore became the cheap oil of choice in all processed foods. Here's a label, I don't even know what this is from. Obviously a processed food given the ingredients and there's hydrogenated soybean oil on there. If you ever check the label on processed food, it's probably soybean oil or vegetable oil of some kind. Okay, now we're getting to the trans fats. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about chemistry. Um, trans fat, um, a hydrogenated fat, they start with a liquid fat polyunsaturated liquid fat, and they turn it into a solid fat at room temperature. Well, how do they do this? <clears throat> we start with, here's our polyunsaturated fat, and what they do is they have the technology to shoot it with hydrogens. You can see I'm shooting it with hydrogens right now. <laughs> and you essentially kind of saturate it. You make it solid. Um, obviously, it's not found in nature. And, I mean, this came back to haunt us. So now we know that trans fats is are terrible for our health, and all of, every food manufacturer out there is trying to get them out of our diet. Refined oils and shortening is what we see in all of this stuff, all of this processed foods. You will not see a traditional fat in these foods, <clears throat> and also in our fast foods. Okay, traditional versus processed fats. This is a graph. Um, I don't know if you can see it very well, but on the, the top half, or on the other side, on the top half, um, is butter and lard. And butter and lard goes down, um, and then shortening in oils and margarine kind of skyrockets. Margarine goes down, and shortening goes down after the um, introduction or after we found out trans fats are bad for us, and oils continues to skyrocket. Well, our fear of cholesterol is a big part of that because there's no cholesterol in plants. So if we hydrogenate a plant oil, 
and make it fat, then there's still no, or make it solid, there's still no cholesterol in it. Um, so our fear of cholesterol also is why we're eat eating all these vegetable oils and why vegetable oils are skyrocketing and why we see this decline in butter and water. Um, at the beginning there, the technology for hydrogenation comes into play, and then the oil seed processing technology and the low-fat guidelines. You can see just the skyrocket in um, those things when the fear of saturated fat set in. Um, and obviously, an insane increase in processed foods. Everyone can just understand that. So what does fat do in the body? A lot of times we just focus on weight, fat and weight. And this is something I try to deconstruct in my patients also. Um, it gives us energy, spares your body from breaking down muscle tissue, um, temperature control, stabilizes blood sugars. I work in a diabetic clinic. Um, I ch really try to get all my patients to incorporate fat in every single meal to help stabilize their blood sugars, absorb fat-soluble vitamins, and form structural cells and tissues. Now I want you guys to forget about this image and replace it with the cell membrane. We're going to talk about the cell membrane today. Um, and that's, if anyone remembers basic biology, it's what encompasses each and every one of our cells. So if we zoom in on the cell membrane, we have what we call this phospholipid bilayer. It's these two layers that encompass, that make up the cell wall, or the cell membrane. And lipid is another word for fat. So every single one of those tails you see on that thing, that is a fatty acid. It's a huge component of every single one of our cell membranes. If we zoom in on that, um, there's the phospholipid head and then the tail, one is a saturated fatty acid and one is an unsaturated fatty acid. So every single one of those tails is a fatty acid. And here's a, a look at a real cell membrane and you can see the little dangling legs. Every single one of them is a fatty acid. Um, and there's phospholipid there. Oh, whoops. Okay, so a healthy cell with a healthy cell membrane, um, the waste products can get out and nutrients can get in. There's this fluidity. Minimally processed fats and oils that have been in, this, in the human diet since the start of humans really promotes that fluidity. And um, when the cell membrane is hard and rigid, it's unhealthy. Only some nutrients get in, only some waste products get out. That's rigidity. Just picture these like super rigid cells. And that's caused by highly processed and refined fats and oils. So we have a foreign invented fat like Crisco comprising our cell membranes, very poor fluidity, very poor communication, all that kind of stuff. Rigid. Highly refined vegetable oil, same thing creates this rigidity. Minimally processed fats, on the other hand, that have been in the human diet since forever, and what our bodies kind of developed on, it creates this flow in and out of the cell. So our cells can function right, they, communi they can communicate to each other right, all that kind of stuff. There's a fluidity. So let's talk about beef and beef towel, how it's made. This is a traditional food, a traditional fat. You start with you know, the fat that you cut off of the raw meat and you cut it into small pieces or modern technology, you can blend it up or put it in a food processor. You put it in a crock pot and you let it cook down and then you strain it and there you have it. You have this fat. You can do it in your own home. Most of you probably have access to a lot of beef that you can do this with. So what about grass-finished beef? What makes it different than grain-fed beef? A uh, summary of it would be, it has a fatty acid profile consisting of beneficial fats that are currently lacking in the Western diet. A healthy ratio of omega-6 and omega-3. I'll be talking about that a little more in depth. I'm sure many of you have heard of, have heard of omega-3s, fish oil, the benefits of fish oil. It also has this thing called co conjugated linoleic acid, or CLA. And it has transvexinic acid, that's a new one. I studied this. Um, about 10 years ago, I did a lot of research on this, and I hadn't heard that one yet. Um, additional benefits, more fat-soluble vitamins than grain-fed beef, 
and it has precursors to cancer-fighting super antioxidants called glutathione and superoxide dismutase. And everywhere I look in research, everyone is talking about these two antioxidants that our human body produces within itself. So you eat foods that promote the production of these antioxidants. And actually, I've heard a lot of people who are eating grass-fed whey protein and putting that in their smoothies are seeing an increase in glutathione specifically there. So omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, what is the deal? These are um, polyunsaturated essential fatty acids. We need to eat them, the body can't make them. It's kind of like vitamins. Our body can't produce vitamins and minerals, so we have to eat them. They play essential roles in our cell membranes, and they need to be in balance. When I was in school 15 years ago for dietetics, Nobody was talking about omega-6 and omega-3s, just barely. All this research is all new in the past 15 years. Our ancestors ate them in a ratio of around one to one. Ancestral diet, one to one. Our modern diet, it's closer to one to 20. So there is an imbalance. What does that mean? And this shows the changes in omegas over time, the ancestral diet, the modern diet, you can see it's super, super, super steady for most of human history. <clears throat> and then there's a significant rise in omega-6. Super steady for most of human history. Significant decline in omega-3. Both of those right around the Industrial Revolution and mechanization and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so I see a lot of doctors online who are really trying to educate people about this, and this guy is specifically showing the cell membrane and how omega-3 and omega-6 is a huge part of our cell membrane and our cell membrane acting like it should. Um, it says over there, excess omega-6 and insufficient omega-3 fatty acid consumption can lead to dietary balance in the cell membrane, um, leads to cell aging dysfunction and death. Okay, so a healthy cell, our omega-3 and omega-6 is in balance. An unhealthy cell, those are out of balance. Why the imbalance? Well, you guys can probably maybe guess a little bit. Um, Omega-6s are very high in our vegetable seed oils, our shortening, and our margarine. And as you saw, that consumption of that has skyrocketed. <clears throat> and consumption of omega-3s um, in fish and all that other kind of stuff has gone down. Um, so we are what we eat. This is really interesting to me because they, they actually look at people's body tissue. They study people's body tissue and see the composition of fat in it. And in the 1960s, we did not have that much omega-6 in our own body tissue. As we've consumed a lot more, it has comprised a lot more of our own body tissue. And remember, that is in our cell membranes. Cows are what they eat. So cows fed pasture. All right, this, is, this just shows the fatty acid content of feed. So pasture has a lot of omega-3s in it, and the grains do not. The grains are all high in omega-6, just like you see in vegetable seed oils. <clears throat> so you can deduce that this would happen, grass-fed versus grain-fed, the ratio of essential fatty acids. Grass-fed beef is very close to our ancestral balance, closer to one-to-one. -to -one. Corn-fed beef looks pretty much exactly like the modern diet balance, 1 to 17. So here you have grass-fed beef aiming to correct that imbalance and corn-fed beef contributing to the imbalance. Cows also are what they don't eat. Um, Omega-3s vanish in the feedlot, so when your feeder cattle get to the feedlot, they have really high amounts of all these beneficial fats and I saw a graph on this with CLAs also where you know they get there and all these beneficial fats are high they're fed um, grains that are really high in omega-6 and deficient of omega-3 and that just goes down completely and obviously there's a continuum there if you um, are the type of rancher who you know feeds your cow a little bit of grain they're going to be somewhere in the middle depending on how much grain they're feeding them because cows are with you. And this is grass finished, obviously. I use those terms interchangeably, but I saw um, when I was doing this, I saw a guy advertising his, his grass fed, grain finished beef. And I thought that was brilliant marketing because all cows are grass fed, grain finished, unless you actively finish them on grass. 
Okay, so what we're seeing around the world is a global omega-3 deficiency in, in modern world, especially in modern developed countries. Um, you can see the red um, shows the lowest amount, you know, like the people who are most efficient, and that's all of the U.S. and Canada. Um, and then people who are adequate in the red, or in the green, are all where there's a lot of fish available. And so it's still a big part of their modern diet, the fishes. Um, so obviously we need to work on this deficiency. What does this deficiency mean? Like, what can it lead to? Well, you can lead to pretty much every single disease out there because this is lining our cells in our liver, this is lining our cells in our brain, this is lining our cells in our skin. Our cells are made of this. So in a, a deficiency or an imbalance in our fats can lead to just about anything, especially things in our brain because our brain is especially concentrated with the, the need for omega-3 fatty acids for whatever reason. It needs a lot more than the rest of our body. So you'll see omega-3 deficiency in brain disorders and in hearing a lot more doctors who are treating Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, these types of things, kids with you know learning difficulties, ADHD, really boosting the fish oil, the omega-3 content. Even in higher concentrations in the brain. Here I have a brain lifting weights with this fish oil. So getting back to that cell membrane, got our fish oil brain guy, and then a fluidity. Okay, so this is um, shows all the pasture land, and I'm sure a farmer and rancher would look at this very differently than a dietitian who is aware of the extreme deficiency of omega-3s. To me, this is a huge opportunity to take advantage of that grass, finish more cows on grass, and start addressing this widespread deficiency that we have. Okay, we're gonna talk about conjugated linoleic acid a little bit. Yet another beneficial fatty acid that builds muscle mass and promotes fat loss, fights inflammation and boosts the immune system, it may prevent cancer. I see people um, really trying to bottle this, put it in supplements um, to help to treat disease, but they're having problems because it is found in the highest concentrations on animals finished on living pasture. If you're feeding them hay in the winter, CLA goes down dramatically. Um, and living pasture is the only way to have the highest concentrations of this CLA. So it makes it hard for these companies that want to mass produce this stuff. So the best way to do this is to eat the actual food. You know, find grass-fed food and eat it. Um, CLA intake from one serving of cheese. You can see there's considerably more CLA in the cheese. <clears throat> or in the grass-fed cheese. And this actually isn't about CLA. Um, it's got mixed in. But this is why butter from grass-fed cows is better, and it's got a higher vitamin content. There's more fat-soluble vitamins in it. So gra grass-fed products in general are just more nutritionally dense. They have more things to offer us. How many of you guys have heard of Bulletproof Coffee? Just a couple, I have a lot in my last group. Okay, Bulletproof Coffee, it's kind of sweeping the nation by storm if you're following any of these trends at all. It's really big with the paleo diet, the ketogenic diet, if you guys have heard of that, intermittent fasting, all that kind of stuff. What it is, is it's grass-fed butter um, and coconut oil put in your coffee and then you blend it up kind of like a latte, which is delicious. It was discovered by a biohacker, Dave Asprey, um, and he was an athlete and he was hiking in the mountains in Tibet, and um, he was getting to a high altitude and the locals brought him into a cabin where they fed him um, tea with uh, local yak butter in it, and it gave him so much, uh, like a huge boost of energy. Um, so when he came back, he was this like super millionaire guy. He wanted to figure out what's the deal with that. And he figured out, he figured it out and the science behind it. And it was legit, he figured out. And so there's this huge movement to then blend grass-fed butter, make sure it's unsalted butter um, with, with its coffee. And I mean, every single morning you're getting a dose of vitamins and minerals, CLA, omega-3s, you know, so you're kind of starting the day off, right? And I wanted to kind of show you, he has this 
he has this diet roadmap um, that he suggests everyone to do. And he has a huge following. So there's a lot of people talking about this kind of stuff. And a huge part of this diet is grass-fed and pastured products. And I circled every single one of them. And it's all in the, you know, bulletproof what to eat section. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> So this is what people are eating. This is these are the trends. People want bulletproof. Biohackers are suggesting it as the ideal food to eat. Bulletproof meats and dairy. Or, I mean, grass-fed meats and dairy. Okay, there's a study done in Australia. Um, they looked at a thousand Australian women and uncovered this, the significant link between low consumption of red meat and lamb and higher levels of depression and anxiety. Now they weren't looking, they were looking at all sorts of different foods. Um, red meat happened to be one of them and there's a strong correlation between low red meat and anxiety. And this was all grass food. And the woman who did it in the study, every dietary food group that they looked at the strongest correlate of mental health was red, red meat intake. So, meaning the better the mental health, or the more red meat intake, the better the mental health that they saw. They originally thought the red meat might not be good for mental health. It turned out it actually was quite important. They were not expecting this. They weren't looking for it. It just what came up in the study. Dietitians are talking about this. When I was in school 15 years ago, all this stuff was, was bad. I mean, don't eat coconut oil, don't eat butter, all this stuff, just 15 years ago. Um, and now, I went to, here in Bismarck, I went to the North Dakota Dietetic Association Conference, and there's a woman there speaking, um, and she's from the Dietitians in Integrative and Functional Medicine, which is what I found is exactly where I belong. Um, and this is what she showed us. Every single client she does a fatty acid analysis on. What are they eating? She looks at omega-9s, which are the monounsaturated fat. She looks for omega-6s, because it's at, we need to eat omega-6. They're essential. So she wants to make sure we're still getting in our diet, but just not from the processed stuff. Omega-3s, um, she looks for. And then I thought it was very interesting. Beneficial saturated fat was on there. And when I was in school 15 years ago, that would have been an oxymoron. Beneficial saturated fat? Like, that doesn't make any sense. But we're starting to find that all this fat is created equal. So grass-fed meat, oops, grass-fed meat is on the beneficial saturated. She wants to make sure people are getting these meats in their diet and in the beneficial saturated. And the reason it's going to all this is people are seeing results with their patients. There's a lot of science backing this now. Um, and what she looks for in terms of what she doesn't want them to eat, she calls damaged fats and oils. All of that processing that all these oils go to, they get very damaged. So we want to make sure that people aren't eating a high amount of these damaged oils and eating more of these whole unprocessed fats. This is very refreshing to me because I've been thinking this for a long time and now it's like validated by my profession. <clears throat> so dietitians, doctors, naturopaths, chiropractors, vets, biohackers, we've gone from demonizing fats and red meats to like literally prescribing them to people. And I don't think this is a trend. I think this is our ancestral diet and science is just kind of proving it now. It's taken a while. So we're going to look at grass-fed beef fatty acids. So we start with the fatty acid profile of grass-fed beef, the basic fatty acid profile. Monounsaturated fats, they've always kind of been good for you. They've never been demonized. You should eat them. Polyunsaturated fat is getting to be way more important, even though it makes up a tiny little portion of that. It's going to be way more important than we ever realized. And we need this omega-3 and omega-6 in balance. And that's what we get from grass-fed beef. There we go. And it turns out these saturated fats that make up most of the meat are considered beneficial. When I did my research on, on grass-fed beef fat 15 years ago, it was part of my grad school thesis, um, 
they didn't call them beneficial then, they just called them neutral. Like they're not really doing anything good or not doing anything bad. So it at least took them out of the bad category and now it's kind of being considered that they're actually beneficial. So I have my favorite traditional oils and fats um, and I brought some here with me today. And if any of you guys have any questions about how I actually use these and apply them, just feel free to ask me. But you can see here, I use a combination of plant-based and animal-based. I use mostly this ghee, pasture ghee, um, which is basically butter. You start with butter and you melt it down a little bit and butter separates, like if you ever melt butter in a pan, you can see that it separates. Well, you pour off like the, you kind of separate it when you pour it off. And what's left over is this ghee and it doesn't have any trace proteins in it or trace um, uh, sugars in it, so it doesn't burn. Because butter burns really easily, this ghee, it, it doesn't burn at high temperatures. It's also called clarified butter. Like chefs use this clarified butter a lot. And I kind of live off this stuff. I use it for everything. Okay, well that's it. Does anybody have any questions today? <laughs> no? Yes. As long as they're finished on grass. Is that what you're asking? Well, it just really depends on your, your consumers have to kind of be in on this with you. And what's happening is there's a huge growing movement of these bulletproof people, CrossFitters, health movement, ketogenic diet. These people like are, de it's like one of the growing, like the biggest growing demands in the agriculture sector and the consumer section, sector. So there, there is a growing number of people who might, you know, if it's significantly leaner than they're used to, they'll figure out how to cook it because they understand the health benefits. That's how I am. That's how a lot of people I know are. I mean, I'll add a big hunk of tallow. If I'm cooking hamburger or spaghetti, I'll start with a big hunk of tallow or a big hunk of ghee, and I'll add the fat in. That might not be on some of these leaner cuts or just like grass-fed beef in general is leaner. So yeah, that just kind of requires a slight education component. Purchasing grass-fed beef somewhere or whatever, Oh, I, I, I meant to look into that, but I, I never got around to it. Um, of what, Melissa, do you know that? Not really. I think there's a lot of If you're worried about, oh, can I call my beef grass-fed and do I have to do a certification, just call it grass-finished. That would be the next presentation and the yeah, next, I think, yeah. And on, it's a case test. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and on the bulk, not so much. Um, there's not going to be that much fat. Are you a producer? 
Or yeah. Oh, okay. Well, um, social media has exploded. I mean, I've seen in the past 15 years going from being like the crazy dietitian to being like people wanting to know more information from me. And it has everything to do with social media. People are learning this stuff on their own time, in their own way, and it kind of wrapping their head around it. And um, I think social media, even though I, I hate it, <laughs> Facebook and all that, um, I think it's kind of one of the best ways and where consumers expect to be educated now. Um, a really... Yes, exactly. And there, that's the demand. That's where it's coming from. CrossFit gyms, go to there, talk to them. The CrossFitters are looking for it. Paleo people are looking for it. Um, I mean, I know I, when I moved back home and I moved into Jed's shop, basically, and I mean, I was like, I had, I had this revelation, like, I have access to this stuff. I need to move back home and be around it. You know, I know so many people who don't have access to it and would love to have access to it. So there's a lot of very strong growing number of people like me. But a really great place to look at is this company called Paleo Valley. Um, Grass-fed producers who really figured out real fast how to market. I mean, they called it Paleo Valley for Pete's sake. It's like, and, and they're growing super fast and they have constant, like they just had this blurb on Facebook talking about how grass-fed organ meats are superfoods. Like stop talking about acai berry and all that stuff. Like our pastures are producing superfoods. So um, yeah, so that's a that'd be a great place to look at. Right. Dude, like, like having corn finished beef. I mean, I mean, compared to say, like open yearling heifers or whatever that are growing up to eight, nine hundred pounds on grass and then fed corn for hundred days. I mean, there, there's a difference there, isn't there? Then, yeah. Um. I mean, I don't know the specifics that you're talking about, but um, but another thing I can say is even if even if my patients, I have a lot of patients who don't have access to grass-fed beef or can't afford it. I work with the tribes, and if I see beef on there, even though I know it's corn-fed, it's still the last thing that I look at because everything else is. I mean, highly processed, refined sugars and flours are one of the hardest things on our bodies, so. I, I don't look at feedlot beef, you know, that most of these people are getting, and I don't even look at that at the time. So if you think about someone who's kind of minimally feeding their cows some grain, and it's local, and you know where it comes from, I still think that that's considerably better than a lot of that stuff out there. You know, that I think there's kind of a continuum. If you have access to grass-fed beef, which a lot of, if you guys decide to finish your own cows on beef, most of you guys have access to it. And I kind of wanted to like encourage the people who do have access to it to at least take advantage of that. Because there's a lot of people who wish they had that and don't. And then one more thing. A lot of a lot of this stuff on social media, you don't you don't have to be it doesn't have to be true and you don't have right. to be right to say it. Yeah. You, you can say it and it's gospel. Right. And that's, that's I know it's hard to decipher through it. I know, I know. Social media, like I said, I don't really like it. But it's where people are going yeah. it's where people are finding information and, and people really are using it as a way to educate themselves. Yeah. I tell people I'm more of a translator now than an educator. Before I was an educator, people didn't have access to information. Now I translate all the social media information that these people are consuming daily. So they come to me, they're so confused, and I help them whittle through the confusion. Like, that's my job. And I'm actually kind of okay with that, because I want, I want people to educate themselves. I don't want people to be complacent in their health. You know, like, I'm not gonna look at anything, I'm not gonna learn anything, and then I'm gonna go to the doctor and they're gonna tell me what, you know, in five minutes, they're gonna have all the knowledge about me and tell me what I should do. 
So, like, I want people to social media it up, but also to try to be a critical thinker and, and to maybe bounce it off, you know, like a health professional that you trust kind of knows you well and believes that food is medicine. <laughs> so. Jen, did you have a question? Well, instead of relying on nutrition science, which changes every five minutes, be like, well, what's good for the land? Yeah, what's good for that? And what science is proving that if you just ask that simple question, then it trickles down and it's good for us. Which is why I love the science of grass-fed beef, because you can make that connection so easily. is on the website for this um, so if anybody has just questions or whatever wants to pick my brain feel free to call me thank you